Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 60 of the Stomp the Bus Show. I am your host, Mark Harris, coming at you solo for this episode. Colton should be on the next one. Uh, please like and subscribe on YouTube, rate and review on your podcast app of choice, and let's get rolling. Wow, that was a that, <laughs> that was a weird game that ASU most recently played against Washington over the weekend. 15 to 7 loss. It's still really weird to comprehend four days later as I'm recording, five days later as I'm recording this on Thursday. Um, For ASU to go, like, let's just say someone had told you ASU would go to Seattle and lose to Washington by one score. That would have been surprising in and of itself. Very surprising. Because the only one score losses ASU had had to that point were to Colorado and Cal. That's it. Oklahoma State and USC closer games, but the score was double digits by the end of it. Uh, Fresno State, obviously not. They go to UW, lose 15 to seven. It's still crazy to comprehend. And it is just such, such a credit to the Arizona State defense to keep the Washington offense out of the end zone. ASU scored more, Arizona State's offense scored more touchdowns than Washington's offense with maybe he's not the Heisman front runner anymore, but it would take a lot for Michael Penix to not end up in New York at least. And he didn't even drop that much from his Heisman front running perch because he had such a huge advantage heading into that game following the Oregon game. So anyway, the defense was masterful. Absolutely masterful. In fact, it's probably one of the best defensive performance I've ever seen from ASU because, you know, I, I, and I'm I'm saying that I've ever seen. Okay. So if anyone, you know, older fans, people who follow the program longer than me, I started really paying attention to this program in like 2013, my senior year of high school. So I'm sure there's stuff that happened before, but in my time as an ASU fan and considering the opponent that's it just an, an amazing, amazing defensive outing. And I know they didn't get a sack, which that's a credit to Penix, I guess. But to force four turnovers, two of which were picking off Michael Penix, is just remarkable. Um, they held you to 13 carries for 13 yards. Absolutely outstanding. And the rush defense hasn't even been their strength for most of the season. But that was just an excellent display. And, I mean, Brian Ward had it dialed in. The uh, A-gap pressures, I mean, he he just kept hammering them and hammering them. And UW, that's generally a good offensive line. I think they have some – they were shuffling some guys in on the interior. But to Ward's credit, they took advantage of that. And they just rushed guys up the middle. Deshaun Mallory, defensive tackle, was an absolute force. Caleb McCullough had a fantastic game. Eight tackles, leads the, lead the team with one and a half tackles for loss. In all, ASU had five tackles for loss. So sure, they didn't have a sack, but they had five tackles for loss. Ed Woods had another, Deshaun Mallory, of course. Elijah O'Neal, a very good game from him, too. Probably his best game as a Sun Devil. And then Tate Romney, who also had a great game. <laughs> Uh, half half a tackle for loss. It's it's still weird to comprehend this. You know, just watching the game, it UW just kept turning it over, and I just had to keep telling myself, "Is this really happening? Is this really happening?" Like ASU has a change. ASU is seven points on the board and led up until like late in the fourth quarter. It's strange. I mean, obviously, I understand what happened with the pick six on the fourth down play. I'm going to get ahead of this. Well, not get ahead of it because it's four days late. But I do not like we can bicker about the play call. That's fine. The specific play call. Kenny, you you can do better than that play call on that on on that uh, that situation, especially with Borgay and his lack of arm strength. However, the decision to go for it totally makes sense. I don't care that you could have put up UW or you could have been up 10 6 on UW. The kicking game was a disaster. Longhetto missed a short field goal early. He missed a, or his, 
he had like a 43 yard field goal. I'm trying to find exactly where in the game, but at some point in the middle of the game that just, they just couldn't block for it. And the fact that they just couldn't block for it shows why they didn't go for it. They just didn't have the guys up front. They just straight up did not have the guys. Yep. It was a 43 yard field goal. It's the third quarter. Um, they just didn't have the guys to do it. And when Kenny Dillingham says after the game, hey, if you're 330 pounds, if you're 340 pounds, come to ASU practice, we could use you on the field goal unit. I don't care if he's like half joking. That shows you the injuries and just the lack of depth of big bodies that has clearly affected this team, clearly affected this offense. So it's... That's why I don't care that they they didn't um, that they didn't go for it, or I, I don't care that they went for it there because if they had missed a field goal or there had been something that had gone awry on the field goal, and then you're down, um, you do what up seven six. So sure, there wouldn't have been a return for a touchdown. I get that. Obviously, a pick six in that situation is like the worst case scenario, but. Um, I get why he didn't go for it. Okay. Like, and especially again, this year, like if ASU wins the game against Washington, let's just say they end up winning, um, whatever the score would be, it'd be a low scoring game. A little bit of that. Does that really change the program that much? And I know that this is kind of defeatist language coming from me. Maybe it does change the program a lot. If ASU is instead two and five and pulls out an ugly win on the road against UW. But to me, the biggest thing about this game is how prepared ASU was and how good the defense was and all, and how good the running game was too. ASU ran the ball really well. This was one of their best running games all season. The Carlos Brooks made a huge impact coming back. So glad to have him back. 10 carries. 63 yards, 6.3 yards a carry. I mean, come on. Scatabo, 11 carries for 51 yards. Pretty good average there, too. Even Borgay was able to pick up some yards. Some of that's just uh, taking what the defense gives you. You know, Badgers. Badger had a good catch. He was wide open. I mean, that pass needed to have been thrown better by Borgay. The one to Badger, I forget. I think it was... Fourth quarter, I don't know exactly, but it was later in the game, and Badger caught it. He got it to Badger, but um, there wasn't any room for Yak. So good good game from Badger. Uh, Conyers, three catches, 41 yards. Stovall, Bryce Pierre. Spreading the ball out, you like that about Borgay, but I mean, when you complete 26 of 47 passes, 4.2 average i mean 196 yards like that's just not good quarterback play it's just not like and you know chris cartman after the game he posted on twitter basically an article that said this is why dillingham went with brashada to open the season and yeah i mean i think i think the more that we've seen from borgay and again i give borgay so much credit for even being in this position with his limited athleticism, um, fighting through all the crap to be a, being a walk on. And he's been super down in the depth chart before. So like, this is all acknowledging all of that, but the more we've seen of Bourget, it's just clear that he's just, there's the, the limitations are too much. And it's looking more and more like the game against Washington last year was the anomaly, not what you could, uh, predict going forward you know and I've said on this show like I grew up as a Washington fan like I'll sometimes listen to Washington podcasts and stuff and I remember people were saying that they lost guys to injury in that game and I think they were down to like freshman corner like freshman defensive backs and stuff so like that probably impacted Borgay's performance last year against UW more than some ASU fans maybe would have liked to admit or think about. But he still did it, so it, obviously it still counts. But my point with all this is... Um, my point with all of this is... He's... 
there's a reason why he was the third string, you know, and if and when Drew Pine comes back, I could see Drew Pine being the starter over Borgay. Because at least with Pine, and I'm not, look, we saw Pine against USC. It's not like he was incredible. But with Pine, I mean, Pine started for Notre Dame last year. And again, you know, he played behind the Notre Dame offensive line and benefited from that. I get it. Uh, but my ultimate point with that is, you just there's a reason why Borgay is like the third stringer you know it's it was very clear I I think ASU if they have either Pine or Rashada in that game they probably win because they probably just get one more touchdown drive you know and UW gave them a lot of opportunities I mean UW had six points like midway through the third quarter okay like that just shows you how awesome the defense was like just incredible so I'm kind of like I'm just not like, I'm not losing sleep about the offense. Like they're just, they just don't have the dudes. They don't have the guy at quarterback right now. And the offensive line did better against Washington. Uh, clearly, I mean, creating some holes in the run game. And then again, no, no sacks for UW. UW did not sack Borgay, but there's still like, they got after Borgay a lot still, you know, like the offensive line injuries, are still a thing so can't just ignore them um but it does show like again it shows that there's issues with this team so i'm not worried about the offense like we know what they are it's not going to be good you're hoping that they like score 21 points in a game and that's the game the asu wins or something like that but uh i just I didn't come away from this game being like, oh, I'm upset that ASU lost and this was an opportunity. It's like, yes, it was an opportunity. Like, obviously, it would have been better for ASU to win this game. I'm not denying that. From a, but from a big picture perspective, the fact that Dillingham had these guys so prepared after a bye week. You know, well, te teams go on bye weeks all the time. They're not always, like, way better the game after the bye week. You know, there's a lot of times the team kind of looks sleepy after a bye week or something. So, that didn't happen. Very impressive. Uh, just, again, the level of detail that Brian Ward and the defense got and just the level of, of aggression. I mean, it's just – that was a really impressive display. And I don't think every team's going to be able to replicate that either. Like, there's been a lot of talk of, oh, did ASU give the blueprint to stop Washington? And maybe they did to a point. But I think ASU has some legitimately like decent players on the defensive side. You know, I mean, BJ Green, haven't mentioned his name yet. Another great game. He's like way up there in the pressure leaders for college football. And he's had a good season in terms of registering sacks. Prince Dorba, not as big of a game this past weekend, but I mean, he has like six sacks on the season, you know? So like there's dudes, Deshaun Mallory, like some of these guys they picked up in the portal, uh, Clayton Smith. Some of these guys, they got in the portal, like, again, it's the injuries. Like, the the injuries have been a big story for this team. And so, like, now that you kind of start to see uh, this roster defensive side kind of come together a little more, um, you can see what it can look like. You know, it's – honestly, like, the defensive performances against Cal in Colorado, they weren't, like – they weren't as good as maybe even they were against USC. But – Man, they bounced back against Washington. They really did. And the, the linebackers, Tate Rodney, or Romney, not Rodney, Tate Romney, McCullough, who, again, was just excellent. James and Jonkum was great. And this is without Trey Brown, too. So I just, I just can't say enough about how good the ASU defense was. And there's some, like, advanced statistics to back this up. So I'm looking at collegefootballgraphs.com right now. And basically what this is, it measures EPA per play uh, for college football teams. And you can categorize it by EPA, like overall, you can do it by overall offense, overall defense. And then it, from there, you can categorize it between uh, rushing offense, rush, uh, rushing defense, passing offense, passing defense. So overall defense, according to collegefootballgraphs.com, EPA, ASU is 30th in the country. 
30th among all FBF, FBS teams, which means if you're 30th, that means there's like 100 teams below you. So ASU was better than like 103 college football teams on defense, at least according to EPA per play. And some of these teams ahead are, you got SMU, James Madison, Troy, Jacksonville State. So like, it's it's not, Georgia is behind us. Now, Georgia has a better defense than ASU. I understand that. But the point is like, it's all of college football that's in there or FBS college football. And ASU is 30th. Passing, they're 25th. The 25th best passing team passing defense in all of college football. Very impressive. Very impressive. And you could see why. I mean, it's been two years against Washington and they haven't really given up a huge deep play. And again, like I'm just going to use the word impressive again. That's impressive. Roe Torrance, two straight years, two straight years against Washington, against Roma Dunze, Jalen Polk, uh, McMillan didn't play in this game, but against two future NFL receivers, he held his own. He held his own. Uh, Ed Woods, good game. Jordan Clark, good game. Shamari Simmons, fantastic game. Like, I just, I just keep, just keep wanting to get out, give attaboys to these guys on defense because, you know, it's, it's tough to play defense when your offense just doesn't do anything, and it's even tougher when you don't get field goals either. So that's it. Yeah, just really impressive. I keep repeating myself on that, but it is, and. Now, after watching that game, I am convinced that ASU is going to win one more game this season. Convinced. Because you can't play that well and be prepared that well, uh, be pretty good in terms of penalties, or at least like non-egregious penalties. Uh, or, you know, we can get into the refs in that game. There was obviously a missed uh, holding call on Troy O'Meary like two plays before the pick six obvious missed holding call. There's no debating it. Like it was clearly just missed. And the fact that they picked up the flag is just so suspect. There was missed calls earlier in the game on against uh, ASU players too. And there's the biggest example would be, I think it was Polk double coverage on a corner. Uh, yeah. Corner route to the end zone. And he was getting mugged before the ball even got there and they just didn't call anything. So it wasn't, I don't think, I think it was just another case of just bad refs. But anyway, played a clean game, matched, not, I'm sorry, not matched the intensity, had more intensity than Washington. Um, and just, I mean, just shut down their offense. And so when I see something like that, it's like, okay, what if you play this well defensively against a worse team? What if you play this well defensively against UCLA or Washington State or Utah, um, Arizona? You know, it's it makes me think that there's going to be one game where ASU again this run of turnover luck continues because prior to this game they had no interceptions despite all these sacks, all these pressures. They had dropped a few from uh, Caleb Williams or at least one. So. Maybe the turnover luck continues to go in Arizona State's favor. There's a lot, a lot of turnovers is just luck. And if that, if ASU gets three turnovers against the more average opponent, they'll probably find a way to win, you know, especially if they're playing at home. If the field goal unit is uh, more put together than it was, it's encouraging. Just the defensive performance that they showed against Washington. Again, holding Washington to nine points and zero touchdowns. One of those was like a 47-yard field goal too. So it's not even like they were chip shot field goals that they were hitting all the time either. Um, it's just so impressive. It's so impressive. The, in, the defense has dealt with injuries too. I just mentioned that Trey Brown is, was gone. Clayton Smith has been in and out of the lineup. You know, so <laughs> it's... It's really impressive, and they just need they just need to have like one more game like this, and they'll win. They'll win one of these games that they just continue this defensive effort, this defensive intensity, just defensive prowess. Like it's not even just like they're playing above their heads. Like no, they have some legitimately good players, and 
like BJ Green is going to be playing on Sundays, I imagine. He's one of the pressure leaders, individual pressure leaders in college football. Uh, I'm sure a lot of scouts saw what he did against Caleb Williams. Like, he's good. Uh, there's probably going to be another guy on this team who's playing on Sundays from this ASU defense. I mean, Rose Torrance is just a really good player. So there's that. Uh, I'm, I'm, there's guys I'm forgetting too. So again, it's encouraging that the defense played so well when you think about looking at the next five games of the season, the final five games of the season. And my ultimate, you know, thesis on that is they're going to win one more game. I just, after watching them play Washington, they're going to win one more game. I don't know which one it's going to be uh, because nobody expected them to win, be even close to winning Washington. So the fact that they did it against Washington makes me think they can do it against another good opponent. You know, all the, all the opponents ASU is playing are on paper better than them, but it just needs to have one game, just one game where the turnover luck goes in ASU's way. The defense plays well. Maybe you get a banged up offensive line. It may not be a pretty win, but it might be a win. So, and I didn't feel that way. I thought the Colorado game was a huge missed opportunity. And it is a huge missed opportunity, especially seeing how they kind of lost to Stanford. Um, but I think just seeing how we matched up against Washington, it's fair to expect, okay, we can probably win one more game. And in fact, I mean, if you look at the line for this weekend against Washington State, it started out, I think Wazoo was like a six and a half point favorite, it's dropped to five and a half points. It means a lot of money's coming in on ASU. I bet a lot of the smart money's coming in on ASU. It's interesting. It's an interesting little, uh, it's an opportunity for ASU. It is. Because one, Brian Ward was on the same team as uh, Washington State quarterback Cam Ward last year. Coached against him in practice. And that institutional knowledge has to be helpful. It just has to. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to limit the Wazoo offense to zero points or something like that or no touchdowns. Like, I'm not expecting them to hold teams to nine points every week like they did against Washington. Okay, that's that's not what I'm asking for, and that's not realistic. But it can mess things up, clearly. I mean, all these, all this blitzing can't be fun for opposing quarterbacks, even if they beat the blitz every once in a while, you know? So, and Washington State has been fading too, you know? This, this game looked a lot different a few weeks ago than it does now. now. Now, don't get me wrong. Washington State is not some garbage team. You know, I think they actually... I, th I thought they actually uh, fought pretty well on the road against Oregon. It's just Oregon's talent won out. Uh, and I think their 44 to six loss to U of A uh, a few weeks ago. I just don't think that's like indicative of actually how good Wazoo is. I think Arizona is definitely better than them, but I also think like they're probably not 38 points better than them all the time. Um, and then they also lost to UCLA and that's a game they lost 25, 17, but they also got a pick six in that game. So that's 10 points they scored against UCLA. So against UCLA and Arizona Wazoo scored 16 offensive points. And then they had like 16 offensive points late in the game against Oregon for a backdoor cover that definitely did not affect me in a parlay. I wish I was lying about that. Oh my gosh. Um, anyway, so my point is they are not like some juggernaut team. They're better. They are a better team than ASU. And I'm sure if you're Wazoo, you're looking at this game, like we need to get right here. And I know even though it's at ASU, I'm sure they're thinking this is an opportunity for us to win, but ASU has to be thinking the same thing, you know, and like Wazoo just isn't as talented of a team as Washington. They're not even close really. They're, and if we're doing just a straight up like talent 24 uh, seven star rating scale, ASU and Wazoo are probably way, way closer to one another than Washington is to Wazoo. And that's factoring in all the, you know, all the play players who left from ASU uh, recent off season and all that, and all the turmoil and roster tumult that ASU has had to deal with. They're still probably 
just from a talent to talent level, much closer to Wazoo than uh, than Wazoo is to Washington and therefore ASU is to Washington. So that is, I don't want to say that's an advantage for ASU, but it probably helps. I mean, so don't get me wrong. This will not be an easy game for ASU at all. No games are easy. I mean, they still have the losses to Colorado and Cal on their record, you know? So it's, it's not like, uh, it's not like there's, Nothing is a guarantee, obviously, but just seeing how they played against Washington makes me much more encouraged that they're going to pick someone off. And I guess we're kind of, I'm kind of done talking about this game, but want to get into some other small ASU sports stuff, but uh, might as well give us our, give out our score predictions. Colton won't be here, but he texted in, uh, he thinks Wazoo is going to win 34 to 20. I I thought this is a tough game, but I think ASU is going to win. I think ASU wins 21 to 17. So Colton and I see this game differently, although we see the ASU offense doing uh, basically the same, but he thinks Wazoo is going to do a lot better. I do not. We'll see how it, we'll see how it shakes out. Hopefully I'm right, but uh, yeah. So overall, good game for the dead the devils, you know, people can get me. Oh my gosh. Yeah. People can get that. Yeah, people can be mad. There we go. People can be mad about ASU actually losing the game. I understand that, you know, I do, but this season is what it is. Okay. Like I've said a lot of times, man, I'm glad X loss didn't happen in another season, you know, because that would be much more painful if it's the difference between going heck going nine and three, or eight and four, like going nine and three at ASU. That's a, that's an accomplishment. It really is. And especially if you can get the 10th win in the postseason. And it's, it, it, I mean, going nine and three is a lot of times the difference between going to like uh, a conference championship game or not too. So Wrapping that all up, the point is I'm glad like a dumb loss like this where you lose on a pick six. I'm glad it's happening in this year. Have all the dumb losses happen this year, okay? Get it get it out of our system. It's like when ASU lost to USC in the first game of the 2020 season. That was like the 9 a.m. kickoff game. ASU had a huge lead or a, I think it was like a two-touchdown lead late in the game. Brew McCoy caught some BS, uh, some ball that like – bounced weird and he just caught in the end zone and then U USC scored another late touchdown to win. I wasn't that upset about that game because it was the 2020 season that it happened in. So really like it didn't really matter, but had that game happened, you know, in the 2021 season, like, Oh, I don't know, going to BYU and not practicing for crowd noise. Can't, can't imagine a team would do that or showing up or I'm sorry, no showing at home against Wazoo or having like 10 penalties against Oregon state on the road or blowing a halftime lead against Utah, a two score halftime lead, you know, all of those types of losses are much more annoying when you're actually competing for something. So I'm okay with the loss. You know, I know people don't want to hear that, but whatever. Um, it, it's more important to me that the team just like played really well you know, just keep playing well. That's the thing. And Dillingham said that in press conferences. Just he said they're finding ways to lose, but they're playing winning football, and he's right. And eventually, if you just keep playing winning football, you're going to win a few games. Turnovers, turnovers will go your way. The ball will bounce the right way, and you'll get that elusive second win of the season. All right. Well, some other ASU teams are not struggling for wins. I'm going to go to – volleyball first they obviously started out the season unbeaten it's been a little tougher in Pac-12 play this past weekend they split their two games winning at Utah 3-0 and losing at Colorado 3-0 but ultimately they're still 19-3 and they're definitely ranked again J.J. Van Neal has done a great job with this team it was not long ago that ASU volleyball was really really in a just listless place honestly it was just aimless they were just bad and asu volleyball hasn't, hasn't always been that way either so 
shout out to them. Another uh, good weekend. And, you know, they aren't really, they did a great job in the non-con of just beating all these teams they're supposed to beat and entering the uh, conference play on a good note. And since they've gotten the conference play, this isn't, you know, like a Bobby Hurley team where they start out 13 and 0 and then end the season, uh, 21 and 13 and barely, <laughs> you know, they lose 13 games in conference play or whatever. So it's a good start and it's just a, it's good to see them doing well. Ice hockey also has not um, had trouble finding the elusive second win. They just captured their second series win. That's right. The devils are four and O after a two game sweep over Northern Michigan at Mullet Arena, punctuated by a 5-1 win on Saturday. Big time stuff. That's what you love to see. Again, if ASU is going to get to the Fort Frozen Four at some point, they just need to stack wins. And getting off to a 4-0 start, that's impressive. They're at Miami of Ohio. Uh, they actually play there. Uh, it's probably going to be today for most people listening. Um on Friday and then on Saturday as well. So if you can honestly, if you can just split those, that'd be great. Uh, getting to four and O has been good for ASU ice hockey, obviously. And now in the U S C H O.com rankings, which is it's the, it's basically the official rankings. And this was tweeted out by the NCAA ice hockey account. So Basically like the AP poll for college hockey. ASU is 13th overall. 13th. <laughs> That's really impressive. Okay. Like I, 13th overall. And I know the, the program's been around for a little bit now, but I mean, they're, they're, you know, next to teams like Cornell, Wisconsin, teams that have just played college hockey a lot longer than ASU, but to be up at 13, really impressive. It really is. Uh, and it's, it's, how do I say this? A, a, uh, a bright spot in the Ray Anderson tenure as Arizona state athletic director has been the hockey program and the growth of the hockey program. And, you know, all of my comments, Colton's comments, you know, Ralph's comments on the athletic leadership at Arizona state still stand because there are more important things than college hockey at ASU. However, they've done a good job with this. It, and it really looks like the program is really on a positive trajectory. Uh, we talked about a few shows ago, them getting really good recruits. So you just love to see what's happening with ASU hockey. Just keep winning games being ranked, getting respect from uh, national, you know, college hockey publications. It's good to see. So keep it up, Devils. Now, this last one is very interesting. This was a tweet from Trilly Donovan, who is a college basketball Twitter account. Um, obviously a joke off Billy Donovan. This came out on October 21st, which I don't want to look up what day that was, but I'm going to do that quickly. October 21st was Saturday of... Last week, he has a tweet that reads, Arizona State beat San Diego State 72-68 to 68 in a scrimmage today per source. 18 points for Kamari Lands, 15 points for Frankie Collins, 20 points for Lamont Butler, San Diego State, 13 rebounds, 19 points for Jaden Ledee of San Diego State. Obviously, that's impressive because those guys were in the national championship game a few months ago. And ASU beat them in a scrimmage. I get it. It's a scrimmage. But you know what? Frankie Collins and Adam Miller. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Jose Perez and Adam Miller did not play for ASU. Now, Darian Trammell didn't play for STSU. But the point is... I think this team, I think this ASU basketball, men's basketball team is going to be pretty good. I do. I I mean, getting Frankie Collins back, getting Jemiah Neal back is enormous. Absolutely huge. Another year with Hurley. The Sean Phillips guy from LSU, there's just been rave reviews about him coming out of camp. The athleticism is turning heads. 
And it probably contributed to the fact that ASU beat San Diego State in a scrimmage. And San Diego State still played some of their key guys. It's a big thing. And hopefully it means good stuff this season, you know. And, of course, like beating San Diego State in a scrimmage doesn't mean ASU is going to magically, you know, not lose to some mid-major school that they shouldn't. They probably will. There's probably going to be one dumb loss in the non-con like there kind of always is. But it shows you the high-end potential of this team, and that makes me really excited because we saw the high-end potential of ASU basketball last year. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. Um, I feel like this – well, that's not true. They, they did get embarrassed sometimes, but – when they were at their best, they look good and they look like they could hang with a lot of teams. And you kind of saw that or someone saw that in their recent scrimmage win over SDSU. So that's big. And especially heading into the Big 12 to have the basketball program, the men's basketball program, be on a clear, positive trajectory is good. OK, I don't want to be limping into the Big 12 in terms of basketball. I want to be going in on a high note. Maybe you get better in the Big 12. Maybe some more recruits come. Maybe you pick up, you know, more big wins through the course of the conference schedule, something, you know, whatever, maybe. Or maybe, you know, you don't, but at least at least you come in on a good note and your people aren't being like, oh, ASU basketball, what a joke. No, like ASU basketball isn't a joke anymore. And I, I, I'm just really impressed that they beat San Diego State in a scrimmage. I know I might be overreacting to it, but... I mean, this was a team that was in the national championship game last year. Okay. They beat Alabama, the conference or the tournament favorite in the NCAA tournament. And, you know, it's, it's just a good sign. So don't want to make too much about it, but I mean, I had to mention it. I had to mention it. It's a, it's a, it's, I don't want to say it's a big deal, but it's, it's an encouraging sign. So all right. Well, thank you for listening. Um, please like and subscribe on YouTube, rate and review on your podcast app of choice. And let me get out of here before I start rambling anymore. All right. Thanks for listening. And as always, go Devils.